good to see everybody this morning. What a great morning it is, and uh, just continue on eating as we go through. Uh, feel free. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started so we can get you guys out of here on time. Uh, we're just glad to see everybody. It's a wonderful day, wonderful morning. Uh, very excited and uh, about the day and, 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 the e and the morning program. Just want to let you know that, in my opinion, there are three key ingredients to leadership. One is you need somebody that's a facilitator that will organize and kind of get things done. You need somebody who is, who is willing to make the sacrifices to make sure it happens. And then you need somebody, a team, that is, that is going to make it happen for you. And so as I, I look out and, and I get the question all the time, okay, wow, how did you get John Maxwell to come speak? How did you get Bobby Bowden to come speak? Well, I asked him. <laughs> you know, it was pretty much as simple as that. But as far as bringing them here and making it happen, it's each one of these sponsors. So I want, I want you to, I just want to say a special thanks to all of our sponsors this morning because as far as bringing the people like uh, John Maxwell and Bobby Bowden and, and, and people that are going to really make an impact on this community, it's you guys. It's all, the, uh, all these sponsors here this morning that, that made that happen. It wasn't me. It wasn't CTCS. We're just the facilitator. We're just the ones that were willing to say, okay, we'll, we'll make the sacrifice if nobody shows up. <laughs> Uh, but you guys did show up, and you, and you made the difference. So I want you to look at, the, at your program and take special notice to all of the sponsors there this morning because they're the ones that, that really made this happen. They're the ones that are bringing people in that are having an impact on this community, and I just want to thank you for that. Uh, we're going to start off. We're going to have uh, Congressman John Carter. Uh, he's going to come up and give us our invocation, and then we will uh, get rolling. Would you bow your heads and join me in prayer, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We, we thank you for the blessing of living in, in this glorious place, Lord. You, you shower us with blessings every day, and we are, we are so grateful. We ask that you would bless this food that, uh, that may nourish us and strengthen us so that we may serve you in the path that you would have us serve. We ask that you would put blessings upon our, our speaker, Coach Bowden, and, and we, we look forward, Lord, to hear what he has to say to, and to further your kingdom. And we ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Jane Meyer to come join me on the stage here, if she would. Last year, uh, about month, month and a half ahead of, uh, before we had our event last year with uh, Dr. Maxwell, we had, a, we had established an award that was called the Central Texas Christian Leadership Award. And our first recipient for that award was Paul J. Meyer. Uh, we had visited with uh, Mr. Meyer, and he was very excited about coming to receive the award. We were excited about having him here. And then, unfortunately, he was not able to attend because of uh, cancer had taken his life. And we were very saddened by that. As a matter of fact, as we met here last year, it was during his funeral. And some very dear friends of, of the Meyer family received the award on his behalf. And at that point, we decided to rename the award the Paul J. Meyer Memorial Central Texas Christian Leadership Award. Fast forward to this year. Uh, we really wanted as we chose the recipient of this year's award and future awards, we really wanted the Meyer family involved. We wanted to make sure that this award really reflected the leadership of Mr. Meyer. And so I, I visited with uh, Mrs. Meyer here, Jane, Jane Meyer, and we talked about who, who would be a good recipient for this award this year, who would really reflect and, and be the person that we could uh, give this award to this year that would really, really honor Mr. Meyer and, and what he meant to this community. 
And we visited, and, I, and at the time, you were going out of town. Uh, Mrs. Meyer was going out of town, and she said, well, it'll be a couple weeks. I'll be back uh, in a couple weeks, and we'll get back and talk about it then. Well, before you got to the airport in Fort Worth, <laughs> she had a name for me. And when she, when she emailed it to me, I was like, wow, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> that may, just makes sense. And Mr. Meyer and this year's recipient uh, were friends for many years. They did leadership training and programs together. Uh, this year's recipient has done leadership all over the world in the, in the state and the United States. Uh, you probably know him best for the leadership that he has had with many countless college young people. Some of them are here in attendance today. Um, this year's recipient was the head coach for the Baylor Bears for many years. Uh, he put a hex on Texas <laughs> in all those years. I think he even ate, ate live worms uh, to motivate his team. So it's with my great honor and privilege that we honor and uh, give the, this year's recipient of the Paul J. Meyer Christian Leadership Award for Central Texas to Grant Taft. Thank you so much, Jane, and the Meyer family. Uh, this is really special to me because Paul Meyer was special to me. He's the essence of leadership. He's the essence of uh, someone that has spent his life helping other people be better tomorrow than they were today. And that's a unique, unique trademark. He was one of the most giving men that I have ever been around. Uh, people will never know what all he did for so many, quietly most of the time. But uh, he uh, was such a great person that he attracted people to him. And uh, when I first started coaching, I came across for my own uh, way of developing and leading uh, a set of principles that I decided to live by and to teach by. And lo and behold, a few years later, I discovered Paul Meyer, who was doing the same thing with the same concepts in another area. So we became fast friends, and uh, he is a person that uh, has had such an impact on the world, not just America, not just Texas, but the world. And for that, we are so grateful, and I am deeply honored uh, to receive this award with his name on it. Thank you very much. I want to read real quickly what, our, what the plaque says. It says, in recognition of Christian service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Central Texas community, we award you, Coach Taft, the Paul J. Meyer Memorial Christian Leadership Award for Central Texas, honored this day, October 15, 2010. Also, um, there's gonna, there is a plaque that hangs in our school that has each recipient of the Paul J. Meyer Memorial Christian Leadership Award for Central Texas. Uh, last year's recipient, Paul J. Meyer, and this year's recipient, Grant Taft, and this hangs, will be hanging in our school. Thank you. At this time, if you would, stand for the posting of the colors.
stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the Once again, I want to introduce to you uh, Coach Grant Tapp. He's going to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, they've been great friends for a long time, and uh, when I asked him, when we Asked him about receiving the award. I asked him if he'd be willing to uh, introduce Coach Bowden for me, and he said he was more than more than happy to. So I present to you, Coach Tapp. Thank you. Well, this is a special day for me to uh, get the award with Paul's name on it, and to be here to introduce uh, a dear friend, one of the greatest football coaches that uh, ever coached in the history of America. And one of the things that uh, our association, the American Football Coaches Association, is each year we recognize an individual as being one of the greatest coaches, greatest leaders of all time. And this year in Dallas at our national convention, Coach Bobby Bowden will receive an award that uh, is very special to all of us. I'm not going to talk about the hundreds of victories that Bobby accumulated over his coaching career because most of you are familiar with that. He is probably, if there are 10 coaches named in the history of the game, Bobby will be in the top 10 when the history book's finally written. Not only because he has consistently won football games and championships. You go just go back and look at the record. It's extraordinary. He finished in the top four nationally year after year after year after year. But what to me is important as a friend, and someone who's known him all these years, is number one, we sort of came up the same way in different parts of the country through the small schools and made our way to Division I. The other thing is that we both believe very strongly in family. Coach Bowden is a great family man, and his wife uh, has put up with coaching and put up with him all these years, and uh, she's to be blessed for that. She's raised uh, sons that went into the coaching profession, so 
There's nobody any more immersed uh, than the Bowden family in coaching. But you know what I've noticed about him through the years is not only is he that great husband for all these years, but Coach Bowden is a great father, a great granddaddy, and even further than that, he told me today. And uh, I'm trying to get there, Bobby, but I, I'm still working on that to get to be the great, great granddaddy. But he is a, a consummate leader, and uh, he has been a leader on the national scene. But one of the things that I admire most is that Bobby Bowden places priorities in his life where priorities are correct. You talk about putting your faith first, your family second, and football and everything else behind those two. That's what Bobby Bowden does. But his love for the student athletes, I think is one of the keys of his success. You talk to anybody that ever played for Bobby Bowden on any level, and they'll tell you the same thing. Coach Bowden cared about me as an individual. That's what they'll all tell you. I've watched him through the years with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He and I have spent a lot of trips and a lot of time helping raise money for that great ministry, and he still does that. Every year, he goes anywhere in the world uh, to help raise money for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes because he knows the end results are those student athletes that he loves so dearly. Bobby Bowden once said to about 6,000 coaches in a lecture that he was giving at our convention, he pointed his finger at those play coaches and he said, in our society today, you are the father figure to over 60% of the young people that you will coach. And the truth is, Bobby Bowden was the father figure even for those that had fathers of their own because of his genuine care and his genuine interest in their lives as individuals, not just football players. If you wanted to draw up the perfect person to coach college football, or you put it in the, the dictionary, Bobby Bowden's picture would be right beside it. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, my friend and one of the greatest coaches of all time, Coach Bobby Bowden. If you don't have leaders, you better develop them. You better do your best to develop them. Get your dad young man and just bring that darn thing back. You gotta keep fighting. You have 100%, that's all you do. <coughs> we buy this field, you gotta go back and ask the chance. Go out there and just knock the heck out of them. I'm talking about take it to them. If we put you in there, I mean, you go out there and you play like Paul Murphy. You don't want to hold nothing back. Are we going to let them beat us? Let's get out there and get on. One of the most creative football coaches of all time has to be Bobby Bowden. I remember in the early days when no one would come to Tallahassee, so Bowden took his team on the road. The Seminoles became the road warriors. You gotta beat them down early. You gotta beat them up physically early, you know, to wear them down, wear them down. You're not a big time player if you go out there and don't make nothing happen. We've gotta go out there as a unit and just do our job and fight as hard as you can.
Steve Abden win number 300. ready to make my last talk now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grant. I can't think of anybody I had rather introduce me than you. I'm so glad to see you and your wife here today. I miss our time together that we spent during the coaching and our Nike events that we, we used to have. But it's good to be here in, t by the way, can we play that one more time? I <laughs> My wife uh, and I married, uh, and my, my career is so much like his. We were talking a while ago. Uh, he was talking about when he first became a coach, he was a football coach and he had track coach. When I first became a coach, I was a football coach and he had track coach. I guess we had to have track to get our job, didn't we? And, uh, and so, but, but our careers are a lot alike. Our beliefs are so much alike. I've been around Grant enough. That's one reason we've gotten along so good. But, uh, but, my, but my, Ann and I, I've said this before, have been married 58 happy years, which is not bad out of 61. <laughs> 58 is not bad. And uh, people, will ask, people will ask me, how do you stay married with one woman for 61 years? I said, well, I said, well she got me straightened out on that when we got married. Ann said, Bobby, you're going to put marriage ahead of football. You're going to put marriage ahead of football. That's what I've always tried to do. And she's always reminded me, even as long as we've been married. I mean, a year ago, Bobby, you've got to put marriage ahead of And quit bringing that up. You've been saying that. Quit bringing it up. We've been married 61 seasons, you know. <laughs> but uh, another, another interesting thing, and a couple of years ago, Aunt and I, if I'm speaking within 50 miles of Tallahassee or 100, she might go with me, you know. In fact, she usually does and, and does my driving. And, uh, but when I go, go this far from home, she can't go, you know, so I fly. But uh, <clears throat> about three weeks ago, we, she was invited back to West Virginia Uni University where I used to coach. Forty years ago, she was president of the tennis club they started there. So they had a 40-year reunion. And she wanted to go back. They wanted to honor her. So, okay, we'll go back. So we'll drive. We'll take two days and drive up to Morgantown, West Virginia. Now, Morgantown, West Virginia, it ain't in the south. <laughs> I mean, it ain't about eight miles from Pennsylvania line, you know. And uh, so it's a long drive from Tallahassee, Florida, there, two days. So we take off. And, she, and I'm going to tell you, she drove the whole way. She drove from the south tip of Georgia all the way up to the north Georgia line. Then she drove right across the corner of South Carolina, then across the corner of North Carolina. Then she cut off a little bit of Virginia and then hit West Virginia, southern border, drove all the way up to Morgantown, you know. All I did was hold the wheel the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way she drives. <laughs> that's the way she drives. 
No, and uh, not, uh, Grant, I know you used to catch it. You, you used to catch this one. Bobby, you love football more than you do me. I know Donnell gave Grant a little that. You love football more than you did me. I said, college or pro? <laughs> no. <clears throat> I, uh, I, was, I was born the year of the Great Depression, 1929. Now, I don't know. Do I remember it? No. I said I was born in 1929. But uh, my grandfather used to build courthouses in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. In fact, there's some of them still standing. <clears throat> this is before World War II. And uh, his wife had died uh, b before I was born. Mother, but mother used to tell me about my granddaddy. When the Depression occurred in 29, how my granddad had gone to the bank to get his money out, and the banks were broke. Everybody was broke. He had nothing. He had nothing, you know. And so, like I say, his wife had died, so he, he back in those days, what did they do? They move in with you. So my granddaddy moved in with us. My dad still had his job, but he didn't make hardly nothing during Depression. I don't know how the world he fed all of us, you know. But uh, so granddaddy and I shared a bedroom. He'd sleep in that we had twin beds, and he'd sleep there, and I'd sleep here. <laughs> then I had an aunt that lost, her, her husband lost her job. They moved in with us. She had two kids. So I slept with two cousins on my bed. You know, granddaddy slept there. I never slept alone until I got married. Then, you know, that. <laughs> <clears throat> I, uh, I was driving from. Pensacola, Florida, to Tallahassee, Florida. And that's right straight across I-10. You can get on I-10 in Jacksonville, Florida, which is on the coast, and you can drive all the way to Los Angeles on I-10. Comes through here somewhere. I think Dallas is somewhere up there. So anyway, Pensacola, Florida is about 200 miles west of Tallahassee, and I, I used to have to drive that a lot of time, go over to recruiting, drive back to Tallahassee. So you come from Pensacola, to, towards Tallahassee, you, you're going to go through uh, uh, Fort Walton, and uh, then you're going on down through Chipley, and you're going through Bonifay, then you're going through Mariana. Then the last little town before you get to Tallahassee is Quincy. That's about 20 miles west of Tallahassee. Small little town. Used to be a tobacco town until they quit growing tobacco. You know what? <laughs> now, everybody knows, and all the students at Florida State know, when they come back to school and they go through Quincy, that on the second floor of that building downtown on the main drag, there's a traffic camera. And if you go too fast, it's going gonna, it's gonna to snap your picture. And the angle it's set, it can get your tag and can get you too, you know. And so I was driving through there a couple of months ago, and I knew that camera was up there. So I, and the speed limit is 35. So I cut my speed down to 30, and I came through there, and I noticed that thing clicking. I saw it go off. I saw it flash. And I said, what the heck's happening here? I was going 30 miles an hour. What's the problem? So I went around the block again, cut it down to 25. Click. Got me twice. And I went around again, tried that one more time. I cut it down to 20. Click. Boy, I went around five times. It took my picture every time. Boy, I got upset. That last time I... I just shook my fist up at it, you know, and said, read my lips, you know, and told it, told it a couple of things. Went on back to Tallahassee. About three weeks later, I get a letter from the sheriff's office in Quincy. I got five tickets for not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> uh, anyway. I, uh, I, I'm one more, one more, one more story. And I'll get around the, I'll get around the truth. Okay. I told this at the Hall of Fame dinner. You were there too. Uh, Ann and I. Ann says, "Don't you tell any stories about me? Don't you? Don't, don't you?" If she ain't here. I tell them. You know. And she's here. She's here. I don't tell stories about Ann. But uh, so Big Ann and I, we decide we're gonna go up to Washington D.C. one summer. So we get get in the car and we drive up to Washington. We stay at the Watergate Hotel. Now, does that ring a bell with you, Watergate? Y'all ain't too young. None of you knows about Watergate, are they? 
And so we, we booked that famous Watergate Hotel. So we check in and we go to our room and unload our bags and we go out and have supper together and then we went to a movie or something and then we come back and go to our room and <clears throat> get ready to go to bed and Ann gets dressed, fixing to hit the sack, she, she says, as, as a woman would, I bet this room's bugged. <laughs> that's all she's got to say. I bet this room's bugged. And that's 40 years, that's 45 years ago. They ain't going to bug these rooms. I know they did back in Nixon's day, but hey, you know, that's, that's history. You know what? Well, I bet it is. And she jumps in the bed. And, well, I, now she didn't got me worried about it. You know what? <laughs> and I, I said, well, I'm, I wonder if it is bugged. And so I, I start checking the room. I look in the keyhole. And I look over the door frame. I look behind the curtains. I look under the bed. I look, I, I look at the vases. I cannot find it bugged. And I'm saying, well, I don't think it's bugs. I start to get in bed, and I look down the middle of the floor. There's a little throw rug down there, eight by four throw rug right there on the floor. I said, uh-oh, well, I bet something's under there. So I go over and pick that rug up, and sure enough, there's a little steel plaque about that long, about that wide, with a screw in this end and a screw in that end. You know, I said, I'll bet you that thing, that's where they bug it. <coughs> so I went over and dressed, and I got me a dime. And I came by and unscrewed that screw there, you know. And then, then I unscrewed this screw here. And I picked it up and looked at it, looked through it and all around it. And I couldn't find anything. Looked down where it was screwed in. <coughs> couldn't find anything. So I screwed it back in. I got to say, Ann, it, it, this place ain't bugged. I've looked all over, you know. We get up the next morning, go down. We're just going to check out. Go by the counter. And the girl, she sees us come by. And she says, uh, was your room okay? Oh, yeah, it was wonderful. Would y'all have any problem? No, we, no, we didn't have any problem. We well, heard about the people underneath it, didn't you? No. Chandelier fell on them. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, it's good. It's great to be here. I tell you, it is great for me to be here. Uh, I, I was in uh, Columbia, South Carolina Tuesday night, and boy, was that a great time to be in Columbia. Y'all remember what happened last week? South Carolina upset Alabama. Boy, they were happy. That was, a e that was an easy talk. That was an easy talk, right? So then I flew to New York the next day, and we did commercials all day long, you know. Then I got spent the night there and got up and flew down here yesterday into Austin, drove up here, and, of course, this banquet. Of course, soon it's over, I'm going home. You know, but uh, it, it is a pleasure. It, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly. I knew I was speaking to a Christian school, and I wasn't sure exactly what they wanted me to talk on. You know, and uh, uh, but uh, I think I get the message that leadership and motivation, more or less, is what what you wanted me to mention, and I will. And let me. I'm gonna tell you tell you a story that uh, I like to I, li I like to bring out. When I went to Florida State as head coach in 1976. Florida State had had terrible. They, they were they were three and eight, one and ten, zero and eleven. So naturally they're gonna hire the let the coach go. So then they hire me to come down there from West Virginia, and uh, 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 it's a, uh, so anyway I'm, I'm excited about being there. Uh, now back in those days, Grant, I'm not sure what y'all's policy at Baylor was, but. The head coach got 10 complimentary tickets every game. I got 10 complimentary tickets every game. I could do what I wanted to with those tickets. But they're, they're kind of for your family. You know, but you can't sell them. You can't sell a complimentary ticket. So I'd give them to the family. And uh, so, the, so now, nobody was coming to the games back in those days. We seated 41,000. Now, it's much bigger now, but it was 41,000. And they were averaging 17,000 a game. Now, that'll get you fired. You got to fill your stadium. If you're if you're if your school's like mine, football's going to pay 90 percent of the bills. You know, you got 18 sports and none of them make money except football. And baseball breaks even. Basketball makes some. You know what? So you got to fill your stands. And so, man, I got those 10 tickets. Well, anyway, I gave my wife one for her and her friend who had come, and I had two children still living with us, and gave them two and for the two for their friends. And I gave the neighbor. I had two left over. Nobody wanted them. I couldn't give them away. Nobody wanted them. Offered them to the janitor. Hey, oh sweet me is going to give you two tickets a game tomorrow. I ain't coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way it was going. 
And I said, I got to get rid of these tickets. So I said, well, uh, tomorrow I got to get a haircut. Uh, but the Friday before the game, I got to get a haircut. I'll get rid of them tickets. I drive down to the Tallahassee Mall. I pull up right front on the curb and right in front of the main door. Everybody's going to pass my car. I got them two tickets, and I put them on the windshield of my car on the outside. You know, and I said, now, somebody will get them tickets. Somebody will get those tickets. And uh, I go in and get a haircut. I come back out, there's 10 tickets on my dad gum windshield. <laughs> <laughs> but also going back to that first year, 1976, you know, I won't know when a game so doggone bad. <clears throat> we play our first ball game away and get beat. We play our second ball game away and get beat, you know. We play our third game away in Oklahoma and get beat. And so, man, now we're coming back to Tallahassee for my first home game. And I'm excited, man. That, hey, we're finally going to be for us. You know, when you play away from home, now they, they ain't going to give you many tickets if you play away from home. You know, when Texas plays it, well, you y'all play that in, up in Dallas all the time. But when you play out of state and you play Nebraska, they ain't gonna give you ten thousand tickets. You know, they're gonna have eighty thousand there, and you gonna have ten. So everywhere I'd played, it was just flocked with the other team. And so now I'm coming back to Tallahassee, and ninety percent of them are gonna be for us. You know, so boy, I'm excited about going back home and having my crowd there. So anyway, so we go out there, and. Uh, uh, play the ball game, and the, 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 a lot of it's, it's nearly packed because they got a new new football coach and new enthusiasm. You know, it's nearly packed, and boy, they're all mine. You know, just a few of them down in the corner of the other school. So we go out there. And, well, at, at the half, it's tied. And there wasn't a lot of points if it was tied. It, might, it was either three and three or seven and seven. You know, but anyway, it's tied. I would have counts. I would have stopped the game right then if I could. I would have taken that tie, you know, because people hadn't seen wins in so long, you know. But we had to go out there and play the second half. So we got out there and played the second half. They kick off to us. We get the ball in our 20. I think we made a first down, and then we started driving again, and we, 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 we come up with fourth down and one. Fourth and one on our 39, right? What do you do? <laughs> hey, but one thing to do, you punt the ball. If you go for it and don't make it, they turn around and kick the field. They got you three. They might drive for a touchdown. No? So only one call, punt, uh, punt the football. Well, I knew that, fourth and one. Punt team, go. They run out on the field. Boo, boo, boo. You know, my buddies, <laughs> my friends, all that crowd for me just booing like mad. You know what? And I'm saying, oh, my friends don't want to go for this. I mean, they, they, want to, I mean, they don't want to punt, you know. Uh, so I, I don't want to punt either. So I ain't going to punt, you know what? So I call timeout. Timeout, you know, and I call my offense up. Right. Punt team, come off the field, man. They, they, want, to, they, don't, they want to go for it, you know. <laughs> Y'all know you've been the same to your school the same way. So I call the offense up there, you know, I say this. Take them skinny receivers out of the game, put some big old fat tight ends in there, and get the <laughs> biggest people we can get, and just go out there and let's get into our wad up offense and go out there and run full back, blast up the middle. Man, we don't need a yard. We only need a yard now, you know. Now, if you're on offense, that's the longest 36 inches you ever saw in your life. <laughs> but anyway, so they, they want to go for it, man. Let's go do it. Well, so we put us, run them out there, right? So they line up, and the other team lines up, and gosh, they throw a nine-man line up there. You know, we ain't going to throw the ball. And we run that fullback up the gut, and our offensive line, they come off that ball. You know, the defense, they come off of the ball. We got a stalemate right there. You know, my fullback hits in there, and he begins to move that line a little bit, but he ain't moving a whole lot. You know, and again, of course, they blow the play dead. It's going to be close. They're going to have to measure it. So officials bring the sticks out there. They measure it, folks. Just missed it that much, you know. Boo, boo, boo. <laughs> my fans, my friends just booed us out of the park, you know what, because we didn't make it. Now, hey, look, 
whoever you pull for, we, it's the same way everywhere. That's not just Florida State fans. That's, that's everybody's fans. You know what? But I like to tell that story. Why? Because it's the nature of our nature of our people today. It's the nature of our people today. As long as you win, you, you just about do whatever you want to do. As long as you win. But if you lose, forget us. Forget us. Now, that's true in my business. I'm sure that's true in your business. It's in true, in, and you know it's true in politics. You know, as long as you're winning, everything's lovely, and they're all for you. But if you lose, uh, you, you're going to catch it. Well, that's, that's the nature, and that's the setting that we have today. <coughs> and, of course, I want to I say this, because this is what I was thinking about when I came down here yesterday. I love our nation. I'm 80 years old. I was born in 29. I lived through World War II. Not as, not, I, was, I, I was 15 when the war was over. But I've loved our nation. And I can remember our nation back when I was young. How much more disciplined, how much more disciplined and honest and true it was compared to today. Boy, it has changed. Some of you, not, not many of you my age, but you would know if you've been there during this time. You know what? How, how things have changed. And I think, about, here's what I thought about when I thought about your school here, Jim. Your school that we're, we're representing here today, that's the way the schools were when our nation began. They were all Christian schools. Our nation was settled by Christians, or at least God-fearing people. Most of them were Christians, you know. And when they started schools, they were all Bible-based schools. Their main textbook was the Bible. Do you read history? Have they changed history so much that we don't know that anymore? Do you realize that the first hundred colleges that we had in this, in this nation were, were, were Christian schools? And their, and, their, and their pastors were, were ministers? That's the way we started. And their main textbook was the Holy Bible. Now, you try to get to the end of the day. There's so many places in America right now. I hope it's not that. I doubt it's that way here. I think y'all are tougher than that. Well, you can't bring a Bible to school. You can't even have a, I've read about some schools here in America, you, you can't even have a silent prayer. They, 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 if they think you're having a silent prayer, they'll tell you to stop. Don't you dare bring a Bible to school, you know. No, we're not going to pray in school. <clears throat> when I went to high school and, and elementary school in, in Alabama, in Birmingham, to the big, one of the biggest public schools in the state of Alabama, a, a school that was perennially a state champion in football, you know what? We read the Bible. They had prayer over the loudspeaker every morning. We had prayer before ball games. We had to memorize scripture in, our, in my high school, you know. I don't remember nobody getting killed in my high school. I don't remember anybody getting cut up in my high school. I don't remember girls getting abused in my high school. But I see it happening all the time now. At least I read about it happening all the time across our nation. Because in 1960, we kicked God out of our schools. We kicked God out of our public schools. You know what? Thank God y'all can have it. I wish we were all like that. I know a lot of people will disagree with me. But I'm, y'all gave me this mic. Y'all ain't, y'all, y'all ain't got it. I got it. You know. But now that, but now that we see... Now that we don't have God in our schools, we won't let, we can't say God. We're going to have a graduation. Don't you dare mention God. And law, law don't mention Christ. You know, you, you run you out of here if you do that. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of places in our nation. It's that way, you know. We're letting it, we're letting it get by, you see. And it didn't used to be this. This nation wasn't founded like this. Our nation became the greatest nation ever within 200, 200 years. No, no civilization, no empire had ever developed that quickly in the 200 years we did. But again, back in 19, I say 1960s, first remembrance I have of passing laws 
by our Supreme Court justices. They took it out of God's hand. God, we're going to take it out of your hands. We're going to put it in our hands. We're going to lead this nation by people, not by you, God. I know you used to run this nation. I know we were your people. I know we all came over here from Europe so we could worship as we please. But, God, we don't need you anymore. We're too rich and we're too wealthy. We don't need you anymore, you know. So we're going to run our own schools now. And there's a story that you remember the, you remember the Cullenbine thing? When those 11 students were shot dead in, in the high school, two, two young men came in there and just shot them all up until they got killed. And uh, there was a story, well, uh, it, not a truthful story, but a typical young girl went to that school and she wrote a letter to God. And she said, God, why did you let my friend so-and-so get killed last week? Why did you let her get killed? And said, God wrote her back, Dear Kathleen, uh, they kicked me out of your school. They won't let me come in your school anymore. I couldn't do anything. You know, that's pretty realistic, you know. And, uh, but that's kind of the way it's been. But, but why why did I even mention that? I, I didn't come here with the idea of saying what I'm saying. But I, when I find out what this is about, I mean, I think it fits. You know, thank God that you people have got a school here that you're basing on Christ, you know, and the fundamentals of it. Uh, I, I just think how lucky your students are. I look how, how, how lucky your students are to get in that. Yeah, yeah. Now, something that Grant and I have seen through the years, because Grant, he might be older than me, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, ain't. I got I got you, Grant. Neither one of us got Joe, though. Y'all know Joe Paterno? I can't stand him. <laughs> that's a lie. They know it's a lie. <laughs> Joe's, a good, Joe's a real good friend of mine. Uh, but uh, we, we've seen, you know, Joe and Grant and myself and guys that coach as long as we have have seen so many things, seen football change through the years. But you know, one of the biggest difference now, the boys that we coach, majority, at Florida State, I would say it'd be 65 or 70 percent of my boys did not have a daddy. Didn't have a daddy. You know, it, it ain't his fault. It ain't the boy's fault. But my question, daddy, is where in the heck are y'all going? You've got to raise these sons. You have these sons. You can't walk off and leave them. And I'm not talking just to you. I got it in my own family. You know, no dad in the home. And uh, don't, don't you agree that these boys need a male figure? They're raised by mamas. Thank God for mamas. Thank God for godly mamas. You know, they're saving us. But we need the male figure in there. A boy is raised by his mother. She, she wakes him up in the morning. She puts his clothes out. She cooks his breakfast. She takes him to school. She picks him up after school. She takes him home. She takes him to practice. She picks him up after practice. She cooks his supper. She helps him study. She puts him to the bed. Next morning, same thing. All his life, no daddy, mama. So when he grows up, what does he want to be like? He wants to be like a man, just like his mama. How come you think they wear earrings? I don't want to be like I want to be like their mama. You know, I'm being facetious there, but it nearly fits. It nearly fits. But uh, but these boys, and, and I've heard it said one time. You know, it's it's pretty true. The think about what I'm saying. The first concept a young boy has of God could be the framework that he went through with his daddy. Because his daddy protects him. His daddy stands up for him. His daddy fights for him. His daddy sees that he has food. His daddy sees that he has clothes, you know. His daddy takes him hunting or fishing or whatever, you know. And that's his first concept, what God, but God must be like. And look at the young boys we've got coming up now that don't have that. I feel so sorry for them. I have so, feel so sorry for him. But so so we uh, Grant mentioned the fellowship of Christian athletes. 
I, I used to come to Texas all the time and speak to LCA groups all over the state. I used to tell the director, hey, look, I'll come every year, but I want you to put me in a different town every year because I want to see what Texas looks like, you know, and he did. And, uh, uh, but the, the whole, f the whole thing was that the, the fellow, the FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, is trying to get these young boys, these young athletes, girls and boys, to be role models for your children or your grandchildren, you know what? Because we're all, I we all worship idols. I say idols, I mean, I'll say heroes. We all have heroes, you know, and um, athletes have a great chance to be a hero. Politicians have a chance to be a hero. Preachers are heroes, you know, and the FCA is really a strong problem, but it's not strong as a church. Don't anybody think the FCA will take the place of church? No. Nothing is important as the church, in my, in my opinion. <coughs> but anyway, that's one of the things that we're going through. Uh, through. Uh, no, I ain't talked much about leadership, have I? Mm. What time do you say be through? Uh, huh? What time is it? Oh, a quarter to nine? You mean I got to go 20 more minutes? I thought it was about through. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> I was afraid I was running over. Boy, we got to go catch the airplane. Airplane. Well, let me just mention some of the things uh, uh, that I think are important in leadership because I know you're all interested in that. You know, I get asked to speak a lot because I went to Florida State, like I told you a while ago, when Florida State was flat down, you know. And then four years later, we under, was undefeated, played in our first major bowl. So people want to know, well, how, what did you do to make it successful? So I try to tell them, this is what we did, you know. Uh, uh, the first thing I did when I came to Florida State, number one, I had to hire staff. I had to hire staff. So I'm going to hire the best men I can find. I'm going to find the best qualified people I can find to coach. And that's what we did. And then we had our first meeting. Then we had our first meeting. Uh, the first thing that I mentioned to my coaches that we have to have is loyalty. We've got to, man, we've got to have loyalty. We won't, we won't succeed without loyalty. We can't worry about what those fans out there think, you know. We have got to be loyal to each other. Y'all have got to be loyal to me. I've got to be loyal to y'all. We've got to be loyal to our university. We have got to be loyal to our athletic director and our president, you know. That is the starting place. Now, people down through, that's been, that's been, that's been 34, five years ago. <coughs> loyalty is, <laughs> you know, I don't see that much of it anymore. I'm sneaking away from us in it, loyalty. I don't care, politicians, you would know. You would know. Your teachers would know. You, you people who build your school will know. It's, uh, it's, we're not as good as we used to be. And then, uh, so once we put our staff together, and uh, we talked about the, how, the parameters of which we were going to build our program. Then I had, to, I had to sell those coaches, coaches, hey, man, I know how to win. If you'll listen to me and do what I say, we are going to win. You know what? Now, y'all have got to believe in me. Then y'all have got to get to those players and convince them we know how to win. And if they'll do what we say, we're new coaches. They hadn't played for us yet, you know what? If they'll do what we say do, then we're going to win here at Florida State. And so that's, a, that's the selling job that you've got to do. <laughs> and my, my first year, I mentioned my first year at Florida State. And, and, and this was a great, uh, uh, to me, universities need, need and I'm going to use football as an example. I could say all the competitive sports, but I'm going to use football as an example because that's what I coached. University needs football. A college needs football. A high school needs football if they can get it. Why? Well, we were a pretty doggone good example. I told you when I came to Florida State, we were at rock bottom. Hey, my first year, we played in five homecomings. Not a one of them was ours. <laughs> I mean, people were playing us that we're going to play you, Florida State, so we can get at least one win, you know. And that's what we were faced with. <laughs> But anyway, so we, we go through my first year of coaching, and this is kind of the way it went. We lost our first game, lost our second game, lost our third game. Now, I had to decide when I went to Florida State, how are we going to build the program? It's two ways. you got to do it one of two ways. We can go with the older guys, 
Or we can put the older guys over to the side and go with just the freshmen and young guys because they're going to be here a long time. These older guys, they, they ain't got about one more year, maybe two years, you know. And uh, if, as you watch coaches go into jobs, they all take one of those two positions. I'm going to go with the old guys or I'm going to not work with them. I'm going to go with the young guys. Now, if you go with the young guys, you're going to lose all your games. But your future, you're going to, you're going to, you'll pull it out later on, you know what? But anyway, I decided, and we decided as a staff, we're going to go with our older guys. They've been here four years. They've, they've lost. Yeah, they've lost like mad. But we're going, to try to, we're going to try to send them out on top. We're going to try to build with our older guys. So we played the first game and lost close. Played the second game and lost close. Played the third game and got blown out. We go back to Tallahassee. We sit down with ourselves. Hey, man, our older guys, they, they don't think we can win. Here, we, 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 we led this team for three quarters and, and got beaten the last quarter. Then this other team, we played them pretty doggone good and got beat at the end. Then we got blown out last week, team we should have beat. They don't think we can win. We're going to go with the young boys. We're going to go with the young boys. So the next week, we played the University of Oklahoma at Oklahoma. Now, if you go back to 1976, they were number one in the nation. The year before, they won the national championship, you know. So they're going to favor to beat us bad, you know. I hadn't even scored. I hadn't even won a game yet. I put seven freshmen in our starting lineup, four on offense, three on defense, and we're going to go play Nebraska. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us, but we're going we're gonna to start all over. We get beat anyway, you know. We go out there, and we kick off to them. They get the ball in the 20. First play of the game, they run that fullback right slap up the gut. 50 yards. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I thought he was going right out the end of the stadium. We finally hemmed him up down there around our 30 or somewhere. You know, now that's the first play of the game, right up the gut, 50 yards. They didn't even waste time going around in. I mean, I'd better done that. I'd have felt better. Take them longer. You know what? <laughs> So now they got first and 10 up around our 30 or somewhere, and they run, run the next play, pick up seven yards, second down three. Next play, they fumbled the ball, lost a couple. And uh, now it's third down in about five. Then they run a play, and somebody, one of the guys goes the wrong way, they don't get nothing, you know. So we end up, they end up about a fourth and, uh, fourth and four down around our 25. And I'm saying, God, please kick. Please kick a field goal, you know. Barry Switzer was the head coach. Well, he sends his kicking team out there, thank goodness. Because if they had gone for it, I'd afraid he'd score and get us seven points. So he kicks and get us, they got us three to nothing. Well, not bad. <laughs> you know, it's not bad. Slowed them down a little bit, about four plays. And uh, so anyway, now they kick off to us. They kick off to us. And it's all red up there in that stand, you know. We take that ball. We come down the field. We come right straight at them. We score in 12 straight, 12 plays, man. We go down and score. We get ahead of them. Miss the extra point, six to three, you know. Oh, about three or four or five minutes, we're back on the seven yard, first down and seven on the seven. Then we fumble. They stop us. They scored. They go out at the half about one ahead. They finally beat us pretty good, but not, not stomped us like I thought they would, you know. And so we're playing all them dadgum freshmen. Uh, we played the next game lost, played the next game lost, played the next game lost. Finally, one. We was going the last three games, two, two, and two and six. Last three games, and we're underdogs. We play homecoming in Tallahassee, Florida. We're behind twenty-seven to ten with ten minutes to go. We hit a ninety-yard touchdown pass. We drove for another one, and we scored another one right before the end of the game. We scored twenty-one unanswered points, and we win the game in the last minute. Next ball game, we're playing North Texas State. That's somewhere out here, ain't it? <laughs> playing North Texas State. The coach was uh, a real good coach at Iowa. What was his name? Hayden Fry. Hayden Fry was a head coach at North Texas State. So we play them. Now, remember, I'm, I'm Florida State now. We're going to play North Texas State up in Denton, Texas. And uh, so it, it was 80 degrees when we left Florida. We come out and work out Friday before the game. It is getting cold. I'm talking about that wind is coming down out of Oklahoma. I'll never forgive Oklahoma for that. <laughs> I mean, that wind was coming down, and I, we're about to freeze. You know what? So anyway, we get up the next morning, five inches of snow's on the ground. 
I mean, I've never seen that much snow. And I'm, half of my boys never seen snow. We go out to the stadium. The stadium's kind of down a little hollow. And all you can see is two goal, goal posts sticking up, one here and one there. They started to call the game off, but, but it was their homecoming, so they decided to go ahead and play it. So we got in a battle out there. They had to, we had to put highway markers. We had to clear the sand off, put a highway marker so you could see where the sidelines were. You know, And, uh, and then we block a punt and score. Then they block a punt and score. Neither one, neither one could snap the ball. It's too, too cold, you know what? Anyway, we rocked back and forth. They had us 21 to, to 14 with about three minutes to go. We get the ball about 65 yards away and drive down and score, you know, with about a minute to go. Then we go for two and get it. And we upset them 22 to 21. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, we've won two doggone ball games, both of them in the last minute. And then we next game, we're playing in Tallahassee against Virginia Tech. They're favored. You know, Virginia Tech. And against Virginia Tech, they are ahead of us about, uh, they are ahead of us, I think, four, four points, I think. Yeah, they're ahead of us about four points. And they got the ball on our four-yard line. And the game's about over. We got about a minute. All they got to do, do is kneel down. They got the game. But they run, and they fumble, and we get it. And we hit a 96-yard a touchdown pass the very first play, and we upset them. You know what? So we won our last three games in the last minute. And uh, so now what do you think our kids learn from? That's those, those freshmen. That's those freshmen I was telling you about, right? Well, they learn, by God, if we fight the whole 60 minutes, we win this damn thing. If we don't quit, if we'll be persistent, persistence is one of the greatest virtues you can have. A boy that won't quit. Anybody that won't quit, you got your winner. You know what? And uh, so they learn that. They begin to learn that. It's a 60-minute ball game. Let's fight for all. Let's fight the whole game. You know, we might win. And we did. Now, the, the story is, goes like this. Four years later, those freshmen went undefeated because they believed. They, they, they hadn't learned to lose yet. Our older guys already learned how to lose. You know what? And it just shows you how important the attitude is in football. You wonder how... Of South Carolina can beat an Alabama last week. Attitude, you know, not that they, not that Bama had a bad attitude. It just wasn't good as theirs, you know. And same thing we see with with Texas nowadays or some of your other schools here. You know, attitude, 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 which is so important. <coughs> uh, I've I've spoken this before, and, and it's uh, my favorite proverb. My favorite proverb is uh, 423, Proverbs 423, when it says, Keep your heart with all diligence because out of it come the issues of life. You know what? I've talked to my players many, many, many times on that proverb. Keep your heart right, man. That's where it's at. You know what? That's where it starts. Man, every, everything you do, man, has to start here. It starts here with a thought. Starts here with a thought, you know. We say heart. When we say heart, we don't mean organ. We're talking about your will. We're talking about your emotions. We're talking about your mind. Everything you do starts right here. You have to tell yourself to do it, you know it. And so keep it, keep it clean. If you fill your heart with, with, uh, with ang anger, it, it can lead to murder, you know. If you fill your heart with lust, it can lead to adultery, uh, you can, uh, hatred. All those can lead to so. So keep it, keep it love. You know, uh, keep it helping other people. Keep with kindness in there. You know what? Because what comes out of there is what you are. You know, we say it starts with a thought, then becomes words, then becomes action, which becomes a habit, which becomes your character. And your character determines where you spend eternity. You know, it all starts right there. You know, it. so keep it, keep it, as the Bible said, keep it diligently. I, one great, I learned a lesson a long time ago. I <coughs> mean, if you, I'm sure have learned the lesson. I was, when I was coaching at West Virginia back in 1970, 
We signed a big tackle out of uh, Bethesda. He was about 6'5", about 265 back in 1970. That was big in 1970. That ain't big no more. I mean, you got to be 300 now. You got to be 300 to play on that line of scrimmage, just about. You know, you might get by 280 if you're a defensive lineman. And uh, so this kid was on 265 back then, which was a giant. And I, when I, we signed him, I said, oh, this boy is going to be an All-American. He is pretty. You know, and I mean, he's just big and strong and good looking, you know. And so he comes to West Virginia. Well, back in those days, the freshman couldn't play on the varsity, so he couldn't play. He played freshman ball his first year. Second year, I said, oh, he's going to be an All-American right off the bat. And so we played the first ball game. He's a starting defensive tackle. <laughs> played Maryland. We won the ball game. Looked at the film. He was awful. He got pushed around. I couldn't believe it. Played the next ball game, Virginia Tech, I believe, again. We, we won it. Graded the film. He was worse. We demoted him. We demoted him. We put a boy about 200 pounds ahead of him, a little old tackle. Kid would fight, scrap, hustle, beat this big old guy out. I'm, so I got to thinking. I said, well, Bobby, you just rushed him. He, he gonna still, he's still going to be an All-American. You, you, he ain't ready yet. You know, he'll, he'll be all right next year. Well, next year, same thing happened. Got beat out again. Then he goes into his last year. Now, picture this. He goes into his last year. Boy, now he's grown even bigger and prettier. You know and so, uh, uh, now during the springtime, every spring, the professional teams in America would bring scouts to my school and every, Grant's school, everybody's school. They're going to scout every college team in America, try to find out where the players are to draft next year because they're going to make their living. They're going to be successful by how, how well they draft. They can't afford mistakes. So they send agents, I mean, not agents, they send coaches to your school in the spring to watch your boys. So the, they come by my office, and they'll say, Coach, you got any boys we ought to look at next year? Oh, yeah, I've got, here's your, here's your list. Here's your list. Here's five names, or here's four names. This top boy right here, I'm sure he's going to get drafted. This second one, I'm, I think he'll get drafted. This third one, I'm not sure if he will or not, but you better keep your eye on him, you know. And this other one, you better keep your eye on him. Now, you, get, you give that coach those names. And what does he do? He goes out to practice that afternoon and watches them. And see, are they really as big as you said? Are they as tall as you said? Are they as fast as you said? Are they, are they good as you said? You know, And they make their judgment. Then they'll draft later on in the year. So anyway, picture this now. I'm standing on the sideline at practice. Spring training, no game. And this scout comes up and stands right here beside me. So we're standing there and watching our kids practice. All those coaches are out there working with all those boys. Well, our defensive tackles who were down here, had to run by us to get up here to the sleds. And so all our tackles came running right in front of us. And this boy I was telling you all about, he's that, that much taller than all my other boys. You know, this scout sitting there and he watches them come by and he sees that, sees that big guy, you know. He says, ooh, who is that? And he says, who is that? Said, That's so-and-so. He looks, well, his name ain't on the list. He must be a sophomore or something, a freshman. No, he's a senior. You mean he's a senior and you, you ain't got his name on here? How tall is he? I said, well, he's about 6'6 six, six now. Well, how, how much does he weigh? Oh, he's about 175. Is he fast? Well, he runs a 5 flat 40. God, that's exactly what we're looking for. Why did he got his name on here? You know. And all I could tell him, I said, he, he, he just don't have it. He don't have it. It. Now, look, it, that doesn't make him a bad guy. Don't get, don't get me wrong. He didn't have it for football. He might have had it for something else. But football, he just didn't have it. You know what? Well, I told that guy that. But you know what? They drafted him anyway. I could have saved him a lot of money if they'd listened to me. <laughs> he, got cut, he got cut in about a week. He got cut in about a week. He just didn't have it. But, that, again, don't think I'm saying he became a bad citizen. He was a good young man. Just didn't have it. That... that here to play to play football, you know, because everybody, everybody doesn't. Everybody's not cut out for that. Thank goodness, thank goodness, you know. But anyway, uh, I've used that expression a lot to talk about the, what what is it, what is it. We talk about it, it's what I just got to saying. It's it's what what we have down here in the heart, which is the mind and the will, your will, you know it, and because that is where it has to start. And uh, uh, I think 
I, I, I've said this before. Well, if I don't have it, what must I do to have it? I say, well, you've got to have enthusiasm. Y'all know about enthusiasm, don't you? Enthusiasm. Don't you agree when you watch somebody play? If, if you watch somebody or some boy or girl, and if they're real enthusiastic, you lo just love to watch them. I love to watch football players very enthusiastic. It's contagious. Enthusiasm is contagious, you know? And that's what you want. You want something to rub off on your ball club. That's why a leader usually very enthusiasm. I used to tell my coaches sometimes they'd be get, get excited before a ball game. Oh, I'm worried to death. Oh, I'm worried. I said, what are you worried about, man? Be enthusiastic. He said, huh? how? I said, fake it. <laughs> fake it. They think, they think you're enthusiastic. They'll, they'll catch it, you know. And, uh, but do you realize where the, do y'all realize where enthusiasm comes from? It's as old as history. The Greeks called it in, in, in theos, which means full of God. You want enthusiasm? Fill yourself with God. In other words, full of spirit. Full of spirit, see? And you and, you and I know, dadgum well, enthusiasm makes a whole lot of difference in success and failure. You know, so uh, enth being enthusiasm, uh, being disciplined, being disciplined. If you want to have it, you've got to be a disciplined. Uh, you've you got to be disciplined. And folks, I don't know how much you read the Bible. Y'all read it every day. It tells you and me how to live. It answers every question, which brings up a thought. I'm on. Don't let me, Jim. Don't you let me get. If I get thrown off, you remind me. Hey, Bobby, you was talking about something else. But I really believe this. Our nation right now is is quivering. You know, we we we've kind of pushed God out of a lot of our things. Our nation is on the brink, economically, economically and morally, which we can we can survive if we'll do what we're supposed to do. But we started off as a nation of God, you know, and then we've kind of let him get away. But to solve the problems that we have right now in America, to solve our problems, God gave us the answer 4,000 years ago. It's right there in the book. Second Chronicles, 7th and, the fourth, seventh, seventh and 14th uh, verse. God gave us the answer today. He said, if my people who are called by my name. Now, aren't we Christians? Aren't we a Christian nation? Oh, some say, oh, we can't say, oh, we can't say that. Why? I'm going to say it. Doesn't Israel call themselves a Jewish nation? Doesn't Iraq call themselves a Muslim nation? Doesn't India call themselves a Hindu nation? Why can they call themselves a religious nation? But, oh, we can't dare. We can't dare. Well, I'm going to do it anyway, okay? I'm going to do it anyway. We are a Christian nation. Now, that, it, everybody's not a Christian. I know it, and everybody in India is not a Hindu either. Yeah, everybody in Iraq's not a Muslim either. You know what? So anyway, but to me, if my people who are called by my name will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. And I'll forgive them their sins. And I'll do what? I'll heal their land. Isn't that what we need? Yeah, he answered that a long time ago. He answered that a long time ago. And I really think we American people have got to turn back. That's why, man, I, I wish every school in the country could be like this one. You know, I mean, you've got your priorities right, you know. But gosh, we've got so many that d just don't look at it that way, you know. But I really think our nation's got to... Got to hang in there with it. Anyway, discipline. And I talked about a positive attitude. And pers I talked about persistence, how important persistence is. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the way I look at it. Your reputation and your character. Your reputation is not as important as your character. Your, re your reputation is your picture. Your character is your face. Your reputation is something that's manufactured, but your character is the way you're, you're born. It's grown. Reputation you have when you get a job, but your character is what you have when you leave that job. Your reputation is what you have when you move into a new town. Your character is what you have when you leave that town, you know. Your reputation is what people think about you. 
but your character is what God knows about you. Your reputation will be chiseled on your tombstone, but your character is what the angels will say about you before the throne of God. Well, I've enjoyed talking to y'all. Y'all pretty good. Y'all, y'all ain't sneered. You, you ain't booed me yet. But it's just, it is a privilege to get to Texas. You have such a great state here. You know what? And, I, and, and you know the things that I value in life, like I've talked, I, ba- I imagine Texas upholds it by a good in the country. You know what? Not that you can't do better. Not that we can't do better. You know, but I, I'm, I'm proud of you Texans. Thank you for letting me talk to you. And God bless all of you. Coach Madden, thank you so much. Uh, What a way to start our day today. Uh, We appreciate uh, all of you being here. Uh, Now, you're going to have to bear with me for one minute because uh, this is a very special opportunity for me. By the way, my name is Ed Thomas. Uh, I have the opportunity, the the privilege to serve as the superintendent of Central Texas Christian School. And uh, this is a very special day for me. I was telling some folks yesterday, uh, some of you that know me know that I have a coaching background. I coached for several years. And as I look back on my coaching career, and I look back at, as Coach mentioned, heroes in my life and heroes in the coaching profession, I can identify real quickly four coaches that have been heroes and role models of mine, even though they really didn't know who I was. Two of those are here today, Coach Taft and Coach Bowden. And because they're here today, I'm going to take this opportunity to share with y'all the illustrious beginning of my coaching career. I was coaching seventh grade football, China Spring, Texas. I'm sure the setting was much like at Florida State. (laughs) Just graduated from Baylor University. Great vision of God's gift to coaching. Coaching my very first game. Balls kicked off to us. Our little seventh grader grabs it and makes a pretty good run back on the kickoff. We got down to about their 40-yard line to start our first offensive series. So here I am calling my first offensive series of my career. And I call three plays in succession, and we gain absolutely no yards. So I'm thinking, okay. Uh, now I've got to I've got to use my strategy. I've got to be a strategist. And so, Coach Taff, I said, "Well, we're going to have to punt. It's it's fourth down and ten. And I'm looking and I'm seeing where we are in the field. And I've got my little seventh graders out there. And I'm thinking, okay, here's my first strategic move as a coach. I need to tell the punter to punt to the sideline." Because we angle it, and that way it gets them out. You know, get, they get the ball deep in territory, and we don't get a chance of a run back or it going into the end zone, and they're getting it on the 20. So I look out at my little seventh graders, and I yell, Troy, who is our punter. And Troy's got a good foot. But I forget that this is the first football game Troy's ever played in. And so I said, Troy, and he looks at me. And I said, punt it to the sideline. And then I sat back, and <clears throat> now that's strategy. My first good strategic move as a coach. So Troy takes the snap, turns, <laughs> and Troy's got a good foot, so he puts, he puts his foot into it, and I'm standing on the sideline still with my arms crossed and proud of my decision, and 
Watch that football go right over my head into the bleachers. <laughs> Realized very quickly I was not God's gift to coaching. <laughs> what an honor it is to be here this morning. You know, what an honor it is to be a part of this community, this Central Texas area. What an honor it is to see the people here this morning that are leaders in our community. And it's a privilege for us as Central Texas, Central Texas Christian School to be able to have the opportunity to join with you this morning, be challenged to be leaders in our community. We have a group of our students here this morning and hopefully you got to meet some of those. One of the things that we're all called to do is to invest in the lives of young people because that's the next generation of leaders. And we thank you for your investment in the young people of this community. We thank you for being here this morning. We thank you of joining in this effort with us. At this time, uh, we're going to uh, have our benediction. Following the benediction, uh, we're going to have the dismissal of the colors. And so please stay uh, standing for that. And it is a great honor of mine also this morning to introduce uh, the, the gentleman who's going to lead us in our benediction, a man who is a great leader, has been a great leader in our community, in the Central Texas area, in the Texas, in uh, the United States of America and across the world, a godly leader. And so we're honored this morning to ask uh, Mr. Drayton McLean to come and lead us in our benediction. Thank you, Ed. Let us bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you daily for the many, many blessings you give us. Thank you for the opportunity to live in America, to have the freedom, but help us to use our Christian values and the influence that we have. We have been so blessed today to first start with the Paul Meyer, a person that we respected, admired, and was a great Christian leader. Grant Taft, <clears throat> the recipient today in the life he is living and the example he sets for all of us. We thank you for Coach Bowden as he was here today. He showed us the important parts of life, humor, not taking ourselves too seriously, but to have responsibility, Christian values, and to let it show in everything that we do and say. We thank you for this school, the Central Texas Christian School, the founders. Boy, it took courage for them to have this commitment and what it is doing today. Be with the leaders, the board, Ed, and the teachers, and everyone involved. They have had a powerful influence, not only in the students, but this community. Help us all to accept our responsibility to move forward daily as Christians. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn. 